Greetings, everyone. This is Fred Coulter on Church at Home. Church at Home is dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today. Let's ask a question. What does it mean to be born again? And why is it the tenth step? Most people believe it's the first step. Because most people believe that born again is a conversion experience when you give your heart to the Lord. True enough, here in John, the third chapter, we'll go there in a little bit. It, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you have been born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And we've seen the 10 steps leading up to it. And the ninth step is the resurrection. Now, what does the resurrection have to do in the connection with being born again? And how is it that it has been so universally misunderstood by all of Protestantism and Catholicism? Now, to help you understand it, we have two articles you can download right from Church at Home. And those two are, what is meant by born of God, and what do you mean born again? Now, those are very thorough and go in great detail into all the scriptures covering born again. But let's first of all begin with Jesus Christ. When Jesus was born into the world, he was the firstborn of Mary. That's interesting because we find in Mark, the sixth chapter, that Jesus had brothers and sisters. What does that do to the perpetual virginity of Mary? Never happened. If you believe in the perpetual virginity and the Immaculate Conception of Mary, and her assumption into heaven. And you believe that with all your heart. Well, it doesn't say it in the Bible. Your Catholic priest may tell you that. They may even have days that the church sanctions to celebrate those things, but it never occurred. So Jesus was the firstborn. Now, let's come to Revelation, the first chapter. And this is very powerful, you see. Because firstborn of Mary, that was his physical birth, correct? Was he not conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary? And through the normal gestation period, he was born, born as an ordinary human being. Yes, he was. That was her firstborn. Well, that was Jesus' physical birth. Is that not correct? Yes, indeed. But do you realize that Jesus was born again? Some people say, huh, Jesus didn't need to be saved. True, he didn't need to be saved. And that shows you don't understand what born again really means. Revelation, the first chapter, and verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. How about that? Jesus was born again. How was he born again? From the dead to being a spirit being again and receiving the fullness of what he gave up so that he could become Savior for us. So there it is. Jesus was born again. Let's read it here in Colossians, the first chapter, and let's see what it says about Jesus. Let's see what it says about his being born again, because he was. And then we'll relate that. What does it mean for us to be born again? And what does it all mean there in John, the third chapter? Colossians 1 and verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has made us qualified for the share of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has personally rescued us from the power of darkness, that's Satan the devil, and transferred us unto the kingdom of the Son of his love. Now we've been transferred to 
when we receive the Holy Spirit of God, but we have not entered into the kingdom of God yet because we're not yet spirit beings, because flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of God. But we are under the authority and jurisdiction of God the Father and Jesus Christ. That means that those who are truly converted are under the authority and jurisdiction of the kingdom of God. And Jesus is the king of the coming kingdom. What did he say when Pilate asked him, are you a king? And he said, for this reason, I was born. And for this cause, I came into the world. But you see, he hasn't yet received the kingdom to rule over the earth. That comes, as we saw in step number nine, at the resurrection. Let's come down here to verse 16. This tells us an awful lot about Jesus Christ and what he did before he became a human being and what he had to give up, what he had to forsake and humble himself to become a human being so that he could die the death on the cross, that he could become your savior, that he could become the sacrifice for your sins, and yes, the sins of the whole world in God's plan as it unfolds. Verse 16, Colossians 1. Because by him were all things created, the things in heaven, the things on earth, the visible, the invisible, whether they be thrones or lordships or principalities or powers, all things were created by and for him. Now think of that. Jesus, who created everything that there is, by the word of his power upholds all things. He came and died for you. And he came and opened the way so that you could receive salvation God's way. And you can't enter into the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven until you go through all the 10 steps of entering into the kingdom of God. And the 10th one is born again. Verse 17 now just showing his power, his majesty, and his authority. For he is before all things, and by him all things subsist. As Paul wrote there in Acts 17, in God and Christ we live and move and have our being. You exist because of the very creation of God, and he's given all of us choices. Are we going to choose God's way in his revealed word? Are we going to yield to God and walk in his steps? Are we going to love God the Father and Jesus Christ with all our hearts and mind and soul and being? Do we agree with God that everything that he has said and done is perfect and right and good and true? And what we should do? Do we? That's the attitude of conversion. But notice here, verse 18, the position that Jesus also has in relationship to the church. Now, that's why we have church at home, because the churches of this world have gone astray so badly that it is almost incomprehensible. And we have a new book that is coming, which is called, Lord, What Should I Do? Now, this is a revision of a book I wrote some 15 years ago. But now, to answer the question for people who have been in the Christian churches of this world, what do I do? I go to church and I find everything falling apart. I hear the same old message. I hear the same old thing all the time. Where is God? What is God? And you know, the churches are so bad, they are creating atheists by the scores. So you need to understand what you need to do. Now notice verse 18. And he is the head of the body of the church, and the church of God are all of those scattered ones who have the Spirit of God, and we are the few. And to take, you know, the marine ads took from the Bible, the few and the chosen. <laughs> That's actually from the Bible. Many are called, but few are chosen, see. We are to be true spiritual soldiers of Jesus Christ. 
We're not to fight now because Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? We well, see the truth is we have to be born again first. So let's consider and go on and find out what that is all about. Continuing now, verse 18, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. The beginning of what? Of the resurrection from the dead. The firstborn from among the dead, so that in all things he might hold the preeminence. That's really something. Now let's come here to Romans, the eighth chapter, and let's see something else. This is quite astonishing when you understand it. Now, remember, we saw that he was the firstborn of Mary, correct? We saw that he was the firstborn from among the dead, correct? Yes. Now, let's come here to Romans 8 and see what else it also tells us here concerning Jesus Christ. Because this follows in with enduring and growing and overcoming. Verse 28, Romans 8, For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, and that means that you've answered the call. And God has a purpose and plan for you, as we will cover. We're going to continually be going through the Bible and covering subjects in the Bible, and that you will see and you will understand that the way to recapture original Christianity for today is, is to be scripturalists. That means we follow the Bible, we use the Bible, we believe the Bible, we rightly divide the Word of God and put it together. That's why one of the very first articles you need to read is the 14 Rules of Bible Study. And that's how you can come out from beneath all the confusion that you find in so many churches. If the Word of God is true and we're all to believe it, why do everybody believe different things? Because they pick and choose rather than take the whole thing. And because they're unwilling to believe and obey God. So therefore, they're blinded. Therefore, they can read the Scriptures and misunderstand. See, not only are you to use the scriptures, you're to believe them and obey them and live by them. Then you have understanding, not until. Verse 29, because those whom he did foreknow, that is in the present physical life, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his own son, to be spirit beings after the image of Jesus Christ. Now continuing, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And that birth takes place at the resurrection because Jesus was firstborn from the dead. Now, let's see what Jesus was talking about here in John, the third chapter. And I think you're going to be quite amazed that it means something entirely different than what preachers read and people read when they come to John, the third chapter, they have in mind that born again, yes, is a, a wonderful, emotional, heartwarming experience that you have when you say, Lord, I believe, Lord, I repent, Lord, enter my heart. And the preacher says, you're born again. We're going to see that's not what the Bible teaches. And as a matter of fact, anyone who teaches that is teaching a lie. Oh, how dare you call my minister a liar? All right, he's deceived. And if he's deceived and doesn't tell the truth, what does that make him? Honest person makes him a liar. Now, in his heart, he may not think so, because a liar thinks he's right all the time anyway, doesn't he? Yes. So, why don't you take up the challenge and prove it? Come to John, the third chapter. And let's read it here. That's why you need to download those two articles, because you will find that it has been completely misunderstood because it goes back to the early church fathers, and they perverted and changed the scriptures. Now, are you willing to set those teachings aside? 
Are you willing to believe what the Bible says? Because if you don't, you're not going to enter into the kingdom of God. And then what kind of salvation are you going to receive? If you receive any at all. John, the third chapter, and Nicodemus came to him by night. Now, Nicodemus believed, but he was afraid of all the political consequences, and he didn't want to be seen with Jesus in the daytime. So he came sneaking up at night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a man sent from God, for no man can do these miracles unless he came from God. Now, think about that for just a minute. If they knew he was sent from God, why would they hold to their lying politics and their cheating traditions and say the way to God is through our human proclamations? Like so many churches do today, correct? Yes. So Jesus answered him and said, verse 3 now, truly, truly, which means, yes, in truth, I say to you, I'm not telling you any lie or myth or fairy tale. Unless anyone has been born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, let's stop right there and let's think on that. What did we learn in the last segment? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Correct? You must be changed at the resurrection in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Correct? Whether you're dead in a grave or you're still alive. Yes? All right. Now, question. If you feel you have been born again by a born-again experience in a Sunday-keeping church by going through the formula that we have already recited— Question is this, can you see the kingdom of God? Because if you have been born again, you ought to be able to see it. Can you see it? Answer is no. So therefore, you have to conclude you're not yet born again, right? What did we already see that Jesus was born again by the resurrection of the dead, correct? Have you been raised from the dead? No. So Nicodemus, being very questioning about this, he said, How can a man who is old be born? Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? So he knew that this was a process of birth. Quite a question, isn't it? So Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, now listen carefully to this. Unless anyone has been born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What does born of water mean? Most people assume that means baptism. Yet, there are those who say you don't even need to be baptized and you're born again. So how is it you can be born again if you're not born of water? If you think it is baptism. You see how confusing that gets? All right, we'll answer the question in just a minute. Verse 6 gives us the answer. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh. Question, were you born of the flesh? Yes. Are you now flesh? Yes. Pinch yourself and find out, yes, you're flesh. And it gets old and wrinkly and, you know, shrivels up like a prune and then dies, right? It happens to all of us. When we're young, we never think about that. When we get about 40, we think, oh, well, you know, I'm still in pretty good shape. Then when you hit about 60, 70, then you know you're winding down. 
Then if you get toward 80 and 90, you know, and if some live to be 100, that's something. I remember reading in the paper here just recently that in Japan, there was a man who was 111 years old, and he was the oldest living man that they had receiving pensions from the pension department, from the government of Japan. So all the officials got together, they took the cameras, they went out to the man's house, and they wanted to, to do a picture on this, the longest living man in the world at 111 years old. So they came and knocked on the door and they said, well, we would like to see Mr. Akihuki, whatever his name would be. And uh, they went on in and, and they said, well, where is he? They said, he's in bed. So they went into the bedroom and they were astonished because there he lay, having been dead for 30 years, all shriveled up like a mummy. Well, now, then they're investigating everyone who's over 100 in Japan because how many families are receiving pensions that shouldn't, all right? There he is. He's still there. He's not born again. Right in his bed, dry, shriveled up like a mummy. Same way with the pharaohs who were buried in these big monuments, you know. They take all the things with them so they can go to the other world. But they never got there. Because look, their bones are still here. And shock and surprise, they don't want to tell anyone, but a lot of the DNA from those mummies is European. You're born in flesh, you agree with that. All right. Now notice that which has been born of the spirit is spirit. Are you a spirit being? No. What did we read in 1 Corinthians 15? There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. The natural body, which is the body of flesh, comes first. There is a spiritual body, which comes when? At the resurrection. So if you're not spirit, and if you cannot see the kingdom of God, you have not been born again. You have been conned. You have been suckered. You have been led to believe a complete false interpretation of the scriptures. Now, let's go on. Do not be amazed that I said it is necessary for you to be born again. Now, let's finish this up flesh. Unless you have been born of water, what happens when you're born of the flesh? You're born of water, right? Embionic fluid. Isn't that correct? And you couldn't be born unless you had that water and that fluid. Unless you came out of your mother's womb with the force of the contractions and the pushing of the embionic fluid to get you out, born of water. What do they say when the birth is about ready to happen? What do they say to the mother? The water has broken. Oh, think how practical the Bible is. So to be born of the flesh is born of water. To be born of the spirit can only occur at the resurrection. And when that happens, you're no longer flesh, you are spirit. And as a spirit being, what can you do? That's different that you cannot do as a human being. All right, verse eight, the wind blows where it wills. You can see the wind blowing, see what it does. But you can't see the wind. You can only see the effects, right? And you hear its sound, but you don't know the place from which it comes and the place to which it goes. Notice this explanation of what Jesus is saying, which proves no human being today has been born again regardless of the pronouncements of 10 million Protestant preachers. So also is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Okay, here is the test. If you are a spirit being, disappear. 
if you have been born again, walk through the wall. Let's try it at running speed. Because, see, after Jesus was resurrected, he was able to walk right through the wall. Right? He was born again from the dead, correct? Yes. How about you? Can you walk through walls? Run through walls? Can you disappear? Can you walk into a room and no one see you? Now, sometimes you probably figure that would really be good, you know, but you can't do it, right? So, therefore, you're not born again. To be born of the water means your first birth. To be born of the Spirit means to be born from the dead, from the grave, changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and that's when you are born again. Now, isn't it amazing how many myths and fairy tales and misinterpretations that people believe and they accept? And someone comes up and says, I've been born again. Tell them to run through the wall. And if they can, yes, they've been born again. But how can that be? Because it isn't going to happen till the return of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead. That's why, instead of being step number one, being born again is step number 10. That can only happen with the resurrection. So here are the 10 steps to enter the kingdom of God. Number one, answer the call of God. Number two, believe in God the Father and Jesus Christ. Number three, repent. Change the way you think. Change the way that you live. Repent of your sins and transgressions. Number four, be baptized and enter into a covenant relationship with God. Number five, receive the Holy Spirit, and by that then you use it to grow in grace and knowledge and overcome, number six, and to build the character of God, number seven, and then you must endure, because the one who endures to the end, that one shall be saved. And salvation comes when? At the resurrection point, number nine, and that's when the seventh trumpet sounds at the return of Christ. And point number 10, that's when you are born again. So those are the 10 steps to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, once again, be sure and study your Bible. Read the Bible. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. And use church at home so that you can understand the word of God. Use our other website, cbcg.org, and download the sermons. We have hundreds of sermons covering every aspect of the Bible, all the things you need to know so that you can be fully equipped, that you can understand the Word of God, that you can learn the Scriptures of God. And also go to our website, Restoring the Original Bible. There you can order the best translation of the Bible possible at this present time, the Holy Bible in its original order. So once again, thank you for inviting me into your home, and stay tuned for many, many more surprises on Church at Home. This is Fred Coulter saying, so long, everyone. <laughs>